Hello, folks. So to begin with, let me share a couple of reminders, uh, especially having read uh, the assignment so far this week. Um, so a couple of reminders. First, why are we discussing such a visceral and difficult topic as abortion this week? Well, as I've mentioned before, Chapters one through seven of the text were primarily devoted to setting forth the various major schools of thought on ethics. In chapter eight, our authors have attempted to create their own synthesis of these schools of thought into their own system of ethics. And they have given you the challenge to do the same for yourself. From here on in, they are applying their own ethical system to various controversial ethical issues in order to model for you how an ethical system can be challenged and tested. Let me also address this problem. What constitutes an apt response to discussion board writing assignment prompts? Now, I addressed this point on July 11th, but apparently some of you missed it. So let me reiterate. I, I get the, what I consider in evaluating responses to assignment prompts are threefold. First, whether you, your answers are responsive to the question. If you skip a question, I'm sorry, I can't give you credit for it. Number two, whether the answers give evidence that the student has read and understood the material. Uh, if you don't cite to the text and the reading assignments, I can't verify that. And if you're just opining off the top of your head, uh, that's opining, that's not doing ethics. And number three, whether the answers show the student applying the material. It's not sufficient just to refer to a key word here or there. Tell me what concept from the text or reading assignments uh, you are informed by and explain how you're applying them. Only then are you doing ethics. Now, the way that you provide evidence that you've read the material is to cite a relevant passage in the material. Now, there are two reasons why we cite sources in academia. First, it shows that the writer is not just making up things out of whole cloth or just giving their spontaneous emotional reaction. Um, but also it gives the reader a chance to turn to the original source and evaluate whether the source is being cited accurately. Hence, merely dropping a key word here or there or providing a site with a date, but not a page number, does not suffice. I've more than once had a student, even citing a page number, I'll make a reference to the text and I read it and I, you know, I don't have a photographic memory. I read it and it's like, wait, did they actually say that? Well, I do, when that occurs, I do look at the text. And sometimes it's turned out that the student picked up on something that I forgot or where I could reasonably understand why they interpreted the text that way. But if I don't even have that reference, uh, I have nothing to go on. Let me turn then to chapter 11 about abortion. And these are comments and observations. Now on page 2227, the authors observe that these changes if enacted by states into laws could strongly affect the rights of women from lower economic classes. Now, I don't know why, but they didn't bring up in this context, an important principle that they formulated in chapter eight, the principle of justice. Is it fair? Is it just that wealthier people have access to important treatments that are not available to poorer people? Uh, now, one major issue that our authors observe on page um, um, observe, I believe it's on page 229, is that people cannot agree on when the human life actually begins. Well, that's fair enough. But, you know, I'm a bit surprised. Let me turn to my PowerPoint on this juncture. Then I'm a bit surprised that having brought that up, 
they do not uh, make reference to, uh, here we go, a common hypothetical used in philosophy uh, on this very point. And that is the ship of Theseus. Here's the deal. Um, according to legend, the legendary founder of Athens was this demigod, this hero by the name of Theseus. And he went on an adventure to the island of Crete. And he is said to have sailed back from Crete. And in honor of his accomplishments during his adventures, um, his boat, according to legend, was preserved. But He's, this was a wooden boat, and thus one at a time, one or another plank went, became rotten and had to be replaced. Uh, at some point, people realized that, oh my gosh, the majority or maybe all of the planks that made up the ship have been replaced. And that raises the philosophical question, when did it become a new ship or is it a new ship? Uh, would it become a new ship when 51% of the planks had been replaced? 60%? 100%? Uh, both Plato and Heraclitus wrote about this problem around 500 BCE, and it was later picked up by both Hobbes and Locke in the 16 or 1700s. By analogy, then, the um, when it comes to abortion, the whole question can be related by analogy to the question of when does an acorn become an oak? When does an egg become a chicken? Just be, if you have something that gradually changes from one state to another, at what point can we say that it is now fulfills that new state? Um, Side note, but this is, and I might have to add this to the written form of this um, announcement, but I haven't watched it, but I understand that there's a TV series that was very popular a few months ago called WandaVision. And I've read that in the last episode of that series, they brought uh, uh, up specifically this hypothetical. On page 229, our authors once again use the exp expression a domino argument when they evidently mean what we call a slippery slope. Now there are exceptions, but typically if you make a slippery slope argument, you need to prove that there is a direct unambiguous connection from step A to step B to step C. So whenever we see a slippery slope, that should set off an alarm as to whether or not this is a valid argument. Let me also point out that they work in a second informal logical fallacy. Uh, what we sometimes recall, refer to as a reductio ad Hitlerum. Now that's a tongue in cheek phrase, but it makes the point that an argument from analogy to uh, the Nazi regime is necessarily suspicious. Um, such analogies sometimes are appropriate, but they have to be used sparingly and carefully. Just because um, not everything that people disagree with will necessarily lead to fascism. On page th 231, the authors state that um, pro-life proponents argue that pregnancy and childbirth are normal functions of a woman's body. Now, this is an argument from teleology, the notion that we can say something about what's proper by inferring its uh, necessary purpose. But in this case, I have to object that, isn't that a bit reductive? Is reproduction all that we human beings of either sex are about? Is a woman less a woman or a man less a man if they choose not to have children? Are we nothing but our biology? 
In another section on that page, the authors quote a Jesuit scholar stating that if the mother cannot be saved, then her life may have to be sacrificed in order to allow her child to be born. Now, that was at, the, at one time a matter of accepted doctrine in the Catholic Church. Let me work in one of my infamous pop culture references. Returning to the PowerPoint again. In 1963, there was a movie made by Otto Preminger called The Cardinal. I've provided a link in the print version of this announcement to the IMDb page. Now, it was released at a time when many Americans were still somewhat dubious about the legitimacy of Roman Catholicism. It follows the story of an American Catholic who, in the course of the movie, becomes at first a parish priest, then a bishop, and then, as per the title, he becomes a cardinal working as an investigator for the Vatican. It was, um, in effect, an attempt to portray Catholicism in a way that would explain its differences from Protestantism, but in a sympathetic manner. And indeed, at one point in the story, he is confronted with just that ethical dilemma, whether given that someone that he knows and loves is pregnant, given that this person is likely to have a difficult and maybe fatal childbirth, he has to decide what to instruct the surgeon. Do you, if you have to, do you save the infant or do you save the adult? And well, watch the movie, but uh, that is a turning point in the story. On uh, page 237, our authors argue that there are no absolute rights over one's body. And again, I have to refer to the example of Typhoid Mary, uh, which I used in another announcement, uh, who infamously was the first known carrier of a disease. She uh, was proven to be able to infect people with typhoid fever, which could be deadly without succumbing into it herself. And she spent the last 20 years or so of her life in quarantine on North Brother Island in New York State. So that would be an example in point, case in point. Now that said, I'm trying to keep these uh, announcements to no more than three pages and ideally two. And I'm trying to keep them at less than 15 minutes if at all possible. So I think I've fulfilled my quota for now, but I will shortly record video versions of the other two announcements. That's it for now. Ciao for now.